morning. morning. Welcome to Walnut Grove. It is a delight to worship with all of you this morning. Just a few announcements before we really get into it. First off, have you signed up to get your picture taken for the directory? If not, why not? We would love to see our smiling face in the directory. You can sign up in the Narthex. You can sign up online. Details are in the bulletin. Food for Friends is looking for someone to help out with dessert this week. So if that's something that you are talented with, as I know many of you are, let them know if you can give them a hand. Uh, Mission Saturday is right around the corner. We're packing shoeboxes for Operation Christmas Child. So if you can be there 9 a.m., we're going to pack so many shoeboxes, your head's going to spin. Uh, and finally, an Advent study by yours truly is coming up. Uh, that's still a ways off, but details are in the bulletin if that's something you're interested in. Uh, and by the way, for any who are deeply concerned, I'm feeling much better. I am COVID negative. It's delightful. Have been so for days. But you know, the recommendation is that you wear a mask for a little while afterwards. And the last thing I would want is for anyone to get sick because of their pastor. So I'm playing it safe. I'm going to wear the mask when I'm not preaching. So don't worry when you see it. It's not because I feel miserable. I feel great. In any case, it's a delight to be back with all of you. Go ahead and stand and let's do our call to worship together. Oh, and it's not in the announcements, but final thought. I believe it's the glow in the dark party tonight, isn't it? So if you know any kids who would benefit from attending an awesome children's event, four o'clock tonight here. All right, you, you can still stand. Don't worry about it. We'll still do the call to worship. Don't be tentative. <clears throat> God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God of Joseph, Moses, and Rahab. God of Wittenberg in Aldersgate in Walnut Grove. Jesus of Nazareth, perfect our faith. Our opening hymn is number 668, The Church's One Foundation. Church is one foundation, is Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. Christian, in what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. As the people of God, we have the privilege of taking everything to him in prayer. What would this community like to lift up in prayer this morning? I'm a part of a group of women trying to get LifeWise started at Riverdale, and um, we're getting a little bit of a uh, backlash from it. And so just keep Riverdale in your prayers, and um, I just pray that the people involved can uh, have softened hearts and welcoming to this new change. Bob appreciates the cards, the prayers, and uh, if you would keep them coming, that would be great. Um, we had a bad night. He was, um, the bleeding has started again and the pain, so he needs continued prayers. Just continued prayer for Terry and healing of his knee enough so he can get out and around again. Con continued prayers for Linda. Hopefully uh, in a couple more weeks she'll get her leg brace off and her uh, wound back off and she'll be able to come to church. My brother Jerry Hosberger did have surgery on Monday. He um, had supposedly the tumor removed from his bladder, was determined to be cancerous. He'll be following up with um, that doctor soon. And I would also like prayers for my son, Chris. He um, has been in Japan for about two weeks. This will be his final week there, and then prayers for his safety and safe travel home. On, he should arrive on Saturday. He's sleeping right now, and um, when he wakes up, it will be Monday, I think, for him to go to work. Thank you. I think we only missed one from our continued prayers section. Uh, so we, we got Bob and Terry and Linda, but keep be in prayer for Justin as well. All right, let's pray. God Almighty, as the weather grows colder, and the shadows grow longer and the days grow shorter. We pray that you continue to fill us with joy. That even as fall slowly turns to winter, as snow begins to fall, that you keep us aware of everything that you are doing, of everything you've done, just how incredible this world is. Of everything you've given us, help us to be grateful, God. Help us to be grateful and astounded, even as the world around us uh, might look a little more dreary in the weeks and months to come. Help us to be the kind of people that can bring joy to others, that can keep the world warm when the weather is cold, that can be a cause for rejoicing. God, we thank you for all the good things that you've given us, for those who've been healed, for those who are just wrapping up their recovery periods, 
for our kids, for a community that is vibrant and active. God, you have given us so much to be thankful for, down to the roofs over our head and the food in our belly. Thank you. Help us to be grateful. But there are so many things we're concerned about, too. And so we turn to you and in your infinite power and knowledge and ask for your help. We pray especially for Bob and Terry and Linda and Justin. We pray for Chris as he heads back home from Japan. We pray for Jerry as he recovers. We pray for Mason who is recovering from a concussion. We pray for the LifeWise um, trying to get set up over in Riverdale. God, sometimes when good things are happening, uh, it feels like Satan is more active than ever trying to get in our way. We pray that everything goes well. We pray that you warm every heart. We pray that everything goes as smoothly as it could so that that ministry has an opportunity to reach kids and share with them the good news of your gospel. God, we pray for our leaders, for our president, for our governor, for our mayor, and leaders across the glo globe. Make them wise, Lord. And we pray for ourselves, for our journey of discipleship. Make us better disciples every day, God. Help us to continually strive to be more like you. Now we pray as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, or forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Would the ushers please come forward?
Lord, bless these gifts that they might bring you glory and help your people in your world. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and I'll invite the kids forward for children's mom. child is that? I'm not sure. I'll see. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Kason, you want to come sit down? Okay, so I know it's a little early, but I did see snow this week. Who all saw snow this week? Yeah, so I'm thinking about Christmas, and I'm thinking about presents. Oh, who, does anybody know what they want for Christmas this year? Yeah, Raylan, what do you want for Lego set. Oh, a Lego set. Anybody else? Charlie, do you have something you want for Christmas yet? Nothing. Parker, you got do you want something for Christmas? A new combine? A tractor? Oh yes, that's what I'm talking about. Yes, so you know, this next week on Saturday, we are gonna be packing shoe boxes. Does anyone know why we're packing shoe boxes? No? We are going to be packing shoe boxes for kids across the world. Do you guys see the pictures up there? It is shoe box time, it says. Look at the different kids and the shoe boxes they have. Do you think they have 500 piece Lego sets in those little boxes? No. What about a squishmole? Do you think they have one of those in those boxes? Yeah. yeah, you think one would fit in those boxes? Well, guess what? I have one of those boxes right here. You think I have a 500 piece Lego set in this little box? No? I'm gonna show you some of the things that we are gonna put in these boxes. And this is what the kids are getting for Christmas, okay? All right, let's see. Ooh, I have a cool soccer ball. Ooh, I have a hairbrush. Some toothbrushes. Some crayons. Some socks. Ooh, this is my favorite one, you ready? Check this out. A flashlight. That's pretty cool, right? Do you like that flashlight? That would be pretty cool for under the tree, right? Okay, okay, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down, sit down. Okay, okay. Woo. We talk about presents, and we're getting excited up here. So these, this is what we're going to send to these children across the world, okay? And they are going to be so excited. I th oh, look at how excited they are in these pictures. You guys see how excited these kids are? Yeah. So if you guys want, everybody is welcome to come next Saturday to help us pack shoe boxes, okay? And you guys can come with your families and we can help pack these boxes so that we can bring excitement to these children. Pretty cool? You guys ready to pray? Yeah. Okay, let's pray, bow your head. God, I just thank you so much for these children and these, uh, their giving hearts and their love for you, Lord, and their love for everybody. God, I just ask that you, um, you help us get through uh, next weekend as we pack our shoe boxes and that we are able to show your love through the, them. In your name we pray, amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 12. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was made out of what not made out of what was visible. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. 
By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For because he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists. And that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. And if you, our next hymn is number 666. That seems a little ominous, doesn't it? Hymn number 666, Sing with all the saints in glory. Thanks for that. Like I said, verse 30. 
By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the army had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, about David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lion, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised, since God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so you will not grow weary and lose heart. Join me in prayer. God, open our minds and our hearts to your holy word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, if there's one thing churches seem to be really good at, it's collecting lists of names. Every church I've ever served in, it does not take much effort to find some closet somewhere with just list after list of names. Whether it's an urban church or a rural church, whether it's a tiny church or a big church, lists of names are the things that are preserved most often. Really surprised me at first. I mean... I, I don't know, I, if I were asked, I would have just guessed that it was sermons, maybe, that were the things that were the most common to find. Maybe there was a really good one a particular Sunday and someone wrote it down. Nope. Um, same with classes. Maybe a really good class would get preserved. Very rarely, actually. Or some particular strategic plan of the church that people thought would be great. All of these things. There's barely any of them compared with lists of names. And just this past week, I went into the study and looked at the bookshelf, and lo and behold, without any effort at all, a list of names. This is a record of attendance from Sunday school from the years 1939 to 1945. So this is World War II era Sunday school records. Um, and it doesn't record every single person's name who was in Sunday school. Uh, apparently in that era, Sunday school was massive. There's well over 100 people here every Sunday. But we do get to see the officers of Sunday school whose role is taken. So, for example, I know that on October 1st, 1939, Mildred Steiner was here. Robert Price was here. Ella Mae Dahl was here. O.T. McBride was here. Ruth Holmes was here. I could go on. There's so many names. I have no idea what they talked about. I have no idea what the conversations were like, which Bible study passages they were studying. But because of this list, I know the names of the people that were there that day. And it's not just our bookshelves that are really good at accumulating lists of names. Uh, our scriptures are pretty good at it, too. You can find lists of names throughout scripture without even trying. Uh, I challenged myself this past week. How quick can I find a list of names without trying in the Bible? Uh, under 10 seconds. I, I can't even time it because it was so brief. Um, sure enough, I opened the Bible and one of the first things I came across 
was Numbers 34. Um, I'll read this one aloud. You don't have to follow me on this one. But Numbers 34, uh, verse 19 onward, is the names of people who helped distribute land. Caleb, son of Jephunneh. Shemuel, son of Amihud. Elidad, son of Kislon. Buki, son of Jogli. Haniel, son of Aphod. Again, the list goes on. And these are not people that you find in a lot of other places in scriptures. I don't know anything about Buki, son of Jogli. Um, I don't know. He's got a great name, right? But Buki, son of Jogli, I don't know if he was single or if he had a massive family. I don't know what he did for a living. I don't know if he was a, a pleasant guy or a bit of a grump. I know nothing about him except from this list of people who helped distribute land, I know his name and that he did that much. Now, I think it's fair to say the lists of names are often not people's favorite parts in scripture. Um, they're not particularly entertaining. And I, I guess you could find some limited value in looking at them just as a historic kind of artifact, uh, looking back at the names of some of the people that did this historic thing. Uh, I think if that's the most we can get out of, it, out of it, is some brief look backwards at a name, we're missing out on the best of it. The best thing about all these lists is not that we get the chance to look back. These lists give us the chance to pierce the veil between the living and the dead. These lists show us that we are a part of something so much greater than what we can see, something living and active and, and massive. And I can't explain it any better than Paul did in the book of Hebrews. So if you want to turn over to that first reading, and I know some of you might be a little uh, surprised. I, I have no idea what you guys have heard before, who you've learned from. Uh, not everyone believes that Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. I, I know in some churches I've spoken and I've used the word Paul and people have been baffled. They've come up to me afterwards and said, did you mean to say that? Yes, uh, I did. And I know not everyone agrees with that. Some people think Hebrews, you can't know the author. They're, they're just uh, unknown. Here, here's just a brief picture. I won't spend much time on this because, you know, we got other things to get to. But a brief picture of why I think Paul is the author, and there's a sound argument for Pauline authorship in the book of Hebrews. Um, you know, and there's a lot of reasons you could give. To me, the most compelling one is for about the first 1,500 years of the Christian church, the ultra-majority of Christians believed that the author of Hebrews was Paul. And then for about 400 years after that, it was still a massive majority. Only within about the last 200 years have people gotten a little nervous about saying that Paul wrote Hebrews. Uh, and I guess for me, when there's 1,900 years of people, very respectable, very intelligent people saying that Paul wrote it, I tend to give them the benefit of the doubt. But again, if you're really curious, we could have a conversation sometimes. That's not what this morning's about. But just know, when I say Paul, when talking about the book of Hebrews, I think he was the author. And if you don't think that, you know, that's okay. Maybe you heard a really compelling argument to the contrary. I don't think the totality of the Christian faith is wrapped up in Pauline authorship of the epistle to the Hebrews. In any case, let's dig in. Verse 11, now faith is confidence about what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. So this is a list of ancestors in the faith, people who had faith before us, people who had assurance about what was not seen. And he begins that list at the very beginning. Before he even gets to a name, he kind of frames the list in a very particular way. He says, by faith, we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He begins by saying that the seen came because of the unseen, which is a good opening reminder. It is so easy to get so wrapped up in the world around us that we think it's the end all be all, that everything around revolves around what we see, potentially even imagining God as the sort of being that mostly exists to help us 
to do things here because what could possibly be more incredible than what we see? But in truth, when you look at the scriptures, God didn't make everything because it was so incredibly good, but because he was so incredibly good. The things we see are a product of the things we can't see. The things that we can't see are incredibly important, infinitely more important. The things we can see are so temporary. The book of James talks about how everything we can see is nothing more than a mist. Here one day and gone the next. The unseen world is much more important than we imagine. That's where it all comes from. And now Paul gets to his first name. And you'd expect a list that begins at the beginning of creation to start with Adam, right? That's the first guy. Almost every list that starts at the beginning begins with Adam, but that's not what Paul does. Instead, he continues on and says, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. The list doesn't begin at the first to live. The list begins at the first to die. Abel. And what does he say about Abel? He still speaks. It's a very active way to describe someone who has passed from the seen to the unseen, from earth to heaven. Something that I think is really challenging for a lot of Christians today. There are so many explanations about how we go from this world to the next that involve this this really thick barrier between this world and the next, so far that, that you can't even imagine what you'll be like. You can't even dare to imagine being on the other side and thinking about this world, uh, about being on the other side and doing anything that might vaguely resemble what you do over here. For example, some theorize that when we die, we go into soul sleep. You just cease being conscious until at the end of time you stand before God's judgment throne. That's one theory. Uh, another theory, some theorize that uh, you know, when you die, you begin worshiping and contemplating God's magnificence forever. You're just like sitting and watching him because he's so amazing and he's so incredible. There's no need for you to think about anything other than God. You wouldn't want to. That's all you do from there on out. Sit there and quietly contemplate God. That's not what Abel's doing, according to Paul. Abel's not napping. And he's not just quietly sitting. Abel still speaks the difference between existing here and existing there, that the barrier between life and death is thinner than we imagine. He continues on with another figure that you don't expect to see in a list like this. He continues on with Enoch. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was recommended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch appears in Genesis chapter 5, only for a handful of verses there. Um, you find him in Genesis chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. Here's the totality of Enoch in the Old Testament. It just says, when Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, then he was no more. Because God took him away. Now, in the ancient world, people who read that believed that it meant that he didn't die. Enoch didn't die. God just took him without him ever having died. I, I, I still think even despite that being the voice of almost every ancient Israelite we can possibly find, I think there would still be the temptation to say, well, they were just speaking artfully. Surely... He didn't actually die without dying or move from this world to the next without dying. That'd be impossible. It's just speaking artfully, saying that he passed away. But Paul makes sure that we know that is indeed exactly what's happening in that scripture. Enoch didn't die. God took him. One day he was there, and the next day he was gone. 
He passed from the seen to the unseen without tasting death. Can you imagine what that would be like? What, what happened there? I guess his body was just gone. Did, did, did he need to eat in heaven? Did the body change? I don't know. There's a lot of questions to be asked. I can't fully wrap my mind around it. Um, but that's what happens. Again, that barrier is just getting chipped away at time after time. The barrier between the seen and the unseen, between this world and the next. You can just go from one to the other much more easily than you'd think. And then we continue on and we get to some people we know. Now it gets a little more comfortable, right? We know Noah pretty well. Abraham, Sarah, we go through all of them. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in a, the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builders is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he is good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. So we see three people who all died to the world that we see to live for the unseen. We see Noah. Noah built an ark. The world had gotten to a place where God, an infinitely merciful, infinitely good God, warned him, this place is beyond redemption. I'm starting over and it's you and your family that I'm working with. Build an ark. And he did. He gave up everything he knew to follow God. And can you imagine what that must have been like? We, as humans, have this incredible capacity to love something that is totally unlovable. How many places has he, had he been at that he had affection for? How many people, evil though they may have been, did he know and care about? All of it gone. He gave up everything he knew. He gave up what was seen for the promise of what was unseen. And then Abraham, very similar story. We don't really know that much about Abraham before God called him. Presumably he was a pretty normal Mesopotamian guy, just kicking around, doing his thing. And then God said, hey, get up. Time to move. I'm going to work with you. And Abraham did it. He moved and he lived among strangers in this foreign land that God called him to. And in the ancient world, that was a much bigger deal than it was today. I live an hour away from my parents. I just drove and saw them yesterday. It's not such a big deal if I don't live in my hometown these days. I mean, I can call people, I can text them, I can... Yeah, there's a million ways to stay in contact. Ancient world, no. You move, you may never see them again. He moved to a foreign land, he gave up everything he knew. And then we have Sarah. Sarah, who based her whole life around this promise of the unseen God that she would have children, and yet she kept faith even to the very end when by all reasonable standards that time had passed. It was totally unreasonable for both her and her husband to even imagine that they might have kids. Person after person after person who died for this world to live for the next. And we could go on. We could go on for ages. And Paul certainly does. He goes on for many more paragraphs. But we're going to skip ahead a bit because we don't have infinite time. And neither did he for that matter. We're going to skip ahead to when he ran out of time. <laughs> Verse 32, where Paul finally scoots along after many, many examples. I encourage you to read through them if you have the time this week. They're good verses. They're Really delightful. It's fun to see how Paul takes this list of names and brings it to life. But then we reach verse 32 and he says, And what more shall I say? I did not have time to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah. About David and Samuel and the prophets. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword whose weakness was turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign enemies. 
Women received back their dead, raised to life again. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and holes in the ground. All these heroes of faith, all these people who did incredible things before us. And then he says, these were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. Since God had planned something better for us. So that only together with us would they be made perfect. How crazy is that to think about? All of these people who did incredible things did not receive the fullness of the promise. On their own, they did not receive the fullness because they needed us. We are two parts of one whole. Some of the language that has been used since the beginning of Christianity to describe this is the church triumphant and the church militant. The church triumphant are those who have already passed into eternal life. And the church militant are those who are still fighting the good fight. Two different stages, but all a part of the same church. Together, they are the church. And then Paul gets to what is undoubtedly the most beautiful part. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses... Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Occasionally some try to say that Paul is really talking about people who witnessed with their lives. You know, not people who are witnessing. These are people who witnessed in great ways. He's just looking back at this list of names. That's all this is about. Looking back. Look back at these great examples and be inspired by them. But we just read that list. Keep in mind what Paul was doing. What did he do? He started with the first person to die. And he said, he still speaks. And then the next person he brought up was the first person to not die. The whole point of the list is just slowly showing that the seen and the unseen are not nearly as separate as we imagine. And then here he gets to the end of this list and he says there's this crowd of witnesses surrounding us. And the word he uses, the language, if you look at it in the Greek, is even clearer. The word cloud in Greek is nephos and it's the same word that was described regularly to describe people at athletic events. So if, for example, you went to a football game and you were speaking Greek, you might say there's a nephos of people up in the stands watching. Same word. So Paul is actually showing not this weird metaphorical idea of a cloud of people that might inspire you. It's more active than that. This is a crowd of people in the stands cheering for you as you run the race. It's, it's, it's an Olympian style event. Those who have finished the race are cheering from the stands. I hope this morning as we hear this list of names that we gain an awareness that the list of names is not just looking back. It's not just looking at what is gone. To the contrary, it is looking at what is even though we cannot see it. We are looking at, at the names of people who love us and are cheering for us as we continue to fight the good fight of faith. And I can think of no one who describes that shift in mentality better than Timothy Ware. Timothy Ware is a uh, bishop in the Greek Orthodox Church. And he describes how an awareness of that cloud of witnesses was instrumental to his fully becoming what he is today. He writes about going to church and experiencing that. He says, as I entered St. Philip's, for that was the name of the church, at first I thought it was entirely empty. Outside in the street 
There had been brilliant sunshine, but inside it was cool, cavernous, and dark. As my eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, the first thing that caught my attention was an absence. There were no pews, no chairs in neat rows. In front of me stretched a wide and vacant expanse of polished floor. Then I realized that the church was not altogether empty. Scattered in the nave and aisles, there were a few worshipers, most of them elderly. After a while, a deacon came out from the sanctuary. I noticed his vestment was old and slightly torn. And then my initial impression of an absence was replaced with a sudden rush by an overwhelming sense of presence. I felt that the church, so far from being empty, was full, full of countless unseen worshipers surrounding me on every side. Intuitively, I realized that we, the visible congregation, were part of a much larger whole, and that as we prayed, we were being taken up into an action far greater than ourselves, into an undivided, all-embracing celebration that united time and eternity, things below with things above. I hope as we look at this list, this list of names, people who are a part of this very congregation that passed away not so very long ago. I hope you don't just look back. I hope you experience a sudden rush. I hope you feel the immensity of that cloud of witnesses. And notice that those who are gone still speak. They still love us and they are cheering as we run the race. And now the roll call of the victorious. Ruth Ann Garman, Herman Hull, Dorothy Minter, Mary Carr, Sarah Oates, Paul Michael Wells, William Oates, Carl Musselman, Nelson Kritzler, Linda Bash, David Lotz, Floyd Crow, Tom Cook, Veda Kindle, Tom Williams, Vernon Wells, Karen Bash, Rose Hassan, Robert Bash, Judy Williams, James Heilman, Ann Lotz, Joan Woodruff, Richard Terrell, Eunice Titus. Recognizing those who have passed from the seen to the unseen, let us now turn to a celebration that stretches across time and space. Let us turn to Holy Communion. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us, give, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and forever to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so in union with your saints singing for time unending, we sing this hymn to the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in the highest. All praise and glory is yours, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, the one who sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die that we might live. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, all of you. This is my body broken for you. He took the cup, he blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of this, do this in memory of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate this memorial with remembrance of what you have done in anticipation of what you will do. And we ask that as we take this, the body of Christ, and this, the blood of Christ, Holy Spirit, bless these gifts that we might be for all the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. We ask this through your Son, who with you and the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, let there be all honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Would the communion servers please come forward? The table is set, come and feast.
body of Christ broken for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Get the next hospitality Sunday. Mm. Thank you. If you would, please stand for our final hymn. I have been reminded twice now that it is Hospitality Sunday, so that after the service you should all enjoy refreshments. Please do. People are eager to, to serve you. So go forth in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>